Thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's very kind of you to uh, come out on a wet night. Uh, I'd like to uh, tell you first why I'm here. I've uh, been attending a conference of the new Wadu Business School uh, that was began yesterday morning and ended uh, this afternoon. And uh, uh, what I've been trying to do today is to comment on some of the comments that were made at that conference and as well integrate that with my concern with the next financial crisis. Uh, the, this conference was organized, uh, the New London Business School was organized by Edmund Phelps, Ned Phelps. Uh, Ned and I met each other in September of 1955 as graduate students at, at Yale. Ned received the Nobel Prize in Economics in the year 2006. The title of the conference uh, was the Nobel Prize, the first Nobel Prize conference in China, and the other Nobelist who was there uh, was Alvin Roth, formerly of Harvard, uh, now Stanford, who received the Nobel Prize this past year. Gave a brilliant lecture this afternoon. And one of um, the things that sort of hit me as I listened to um, the speakers of yesterday and today is that I've been coming to Asia for more than 50 years. And my first trip here was uh, to Japan, it was in 1961. Uh, one of the themes of the conference today was the economic developments in China and the great Chinese miracle. I've seen, lived through, six Asian economic miracles. The first was in Taiwan, uh, the second was in Japan, the third was in Korea, Singapore has been a marvelous economic miracle, Hong Kong has been a miracle, Malaysia and Thailand are uh, also uh, economic miracles. And one of the themes I want to develop this evening is the Andy Warhol theory of economic growth. You think of Andy Warhol as the United States great pop artist. I think of him as an economic theorist, as an economic historian. You remember that Andy Warhol's most famous quip is that everyone was famous for 15 minutes I was in Chicago when the first Mrs. Donald Trump came through and the headline in the Chicago Tribune was, Havana Trump has used up most of her 15 minutes. Uh, I've taken this quip, everyone is famous for 15 minutes, and bastardized it. And it now comes out as every country grows rapidly for 15 years or 20 or 30. And then this period of rapid growth slows and some other country takes the leadership in the economic growth hit parade. So if we go back several centuries, uh, we would see that the Dutch, the Netherlands, uh, was in the lead uh, as the country with the most rapid economic growth and then about 1830, from 1830 to 1870, Britain took over the lead uh, in terms of the growth rate hit prey. Uh, the rapid growth period in England stopped about 1870. The United States and Germany take the lead in the economic growth hit prey from roughly 1870 to 1920, 1930. If I look at Japan, Japan has two periods as a very rapid growth country. Uh, one's from Meiji, uh, 1863, 65, to 1940. With, uh, you remember that some of the Japanese books in the early 1950s talked of the 1940s as the Great Pacific Confusion. We remember that in the United States as World War II. The 
And then Japan had 30 years of very rapid growth. Uh, it grew rapidly from essentially 1950 uh, to 1990, 40 years. The first few years after World War II were making up the rears. Uh, sort of catching up to where Japan would have been had, had there not been a World War II, or if it had not been on the losing side of World War II. But then its growth was absolutely brilliant. So what I want to begin uh, is by discussing uh, what were the necessary conditions for the onset of a period of very rapid growth, and then why did the rapid growth period end? What happened in Japan? I remember a conference in Chicago in the late 1980s, uh, and the then head of and the uh, the, the founder of. Of Sony uh, was there. Uh, I had met him earlier in the, in the 60s in, in Tokyo. Uh, and he was essentially talking about how the Japanese economy was going to bury the US economy in terms of its great achievements uh, in research uh, and, and development. And then, poof, something happened, and Japan has slipped back. And the theme of my remarks this evening is, unless there's a dramatic change in economic policy down the street in Beijing, we are going to see 20 to 30 years from now that the Chinese growth experience will be very much like the Japanese growth experience 30 or 40 years a brilliant growth, 8%, 10%, very high number. And then something dramatic will happen and the growth rate will fall very, very sharply and there will be immense disappointment because of the failure of the government to deliver on its promises. So that's the theme. Will the Chinese experience 40 or 50 years from now resemble that of Japan? Or will China continue to grow at 10%, 8%, 7%, uh, or 6%? So we might ask, going back to Andy Warhol, what are the necessary conditions for the takeoff into a period of rapid growth? Uh, and my answer is in terms of export competitiveness. The country begins to, has to begin to grow it's exports of essentially commodities, bicycles, bicycle tubes, textile clothing, commodity type products, toys. Uh, I was fascinated when we lived in Chicago and I used to go into the uh, essentially department stores in the, uh, get, in the ghetto areas and look at the labels, where were things made? Um, and the commodities, essentially, that had no brand names uh, would have been made, uh, were, were made largely at that time. This is now the 60s, the late 1960s in Japan. Japan uh, had the advantage of very low wages. It had an excess supply of labor on the farms. So the labor on the farms moved into the factories. Often, they stayed on the farms and moved into the factories a pattern that we see around the world. It is not as if there's a discrete movement from farms to factories. The farmers essentially take on part-time industrial jobs uh, either daily or, or, or seasonally. Uh, the increase in export earnings enables the country to increase its imports of energy and technology. If the country's uh, labor force is literate uh, and has, is easily trained, then the country is able to grow its <coughs> exports at a very rapid rate. And the growth of exports, always on the basis of a price advantage due to low cost labor, enables the country to capture market share. And it captures market share 
from a country that earlier had experienced a very rapid growth in production, uh, but has, be partly because of the aging of its labor force, now has a higher cost structure. Now, the, the, the Japanese rapid growth period ended uh, in part because there was no excess labor left on the farms. Now, the uh, movement of excess labor off the farms into the city leads to a, uh, into the city and into the factory, leads to a surge in the growth rate because these workers are much more productive when they're in the factories. They're selling into the world market at, at world prices than they were when they were on the farms. Uh, there was essentially uh, excess, excess labor on the farms. So that's the Andy Warhol story. 30 years, 40 years of very rapid growth followed by a, something cataclysmic uh, and the growth rate ends uh, much more rapidly and much more sharply than anyone previously uh, had uh, thought possible. Now, what I'm going to do is to uh, apply the Andy Warhol theory uh, to China. And then I want to, uh, that's what I would call the, the structural issue. <coughs> How rapidly, how, oh sorry, how long will China continue to grow at a rapid rate? And then how will it end? And then I want to deal uh, with this issue of what I would call the monetary disequilibrium that is uh, extensive in China today uh, and that will lead us uh, to, the, to, to the next uh, financial crisis. So what has been happening um, in China? We've, we've had a rapid movement uh, of unskilled labor from the, from the farms and villages uh, into the factories, often on a seasonal basis, uh, often young ladies engaged in very low-skill industrial uh, activity. There, and, and I'll do this example just in terms of simplified arithmetic. Their productivity, the value of their annual output on the farms might have been $1,000 a year. Their productivity, the value of their output in the cities uh, might be $4,000 a year. So just the shift in the composition of the labor force, especially uh, more people who work in the farms and the uh, in factories uh, in the cities will give a surge in the growth rate. And I'm prepared to make the bet that if the growth rate had been as average 10% a year for the last 30 years, five percentage points of those 10 percentage points essentially comes from the re-weighting re problem. And the other 5% comes from productivity uh, within uh, the industrial sector, the, the learning uh, within the industrial sector. Now the next point I want to make in involves simple arithmetic. So let's say we start in 1980, and at that time 80% of the people of the labor force are on the farms, and 20% are in the cities, and each year 1-2% to of the labor force, and we'll round up, 10 million people, that's on the high side, but it makes the arithmetic easy. Uh, uh, every year, 10 million people move uh, from the farms and villages uh, in, into the cities uh, and, and into the factories. So within the course of uh, 10 years, uh, essentially, the urban labor force, the industrial labor force, has increased by 100 million. That's a, high num a higher number. Uh, but I'm using it uh, because of the arithmetic. So if we make the assumption that the number of people who are moving each year is 10 million, as the labor force in the factories and the cities becomes larger and larger, the impact of that continuous movement 
on the increase in output becomes progressively smaller. So if you thought of this as a fraction, Uh, what we have uh, are an increase of, t of 10 million each year in the labor force in the numerator, but in the denominator we have 100 million, and then plus 10, plus 10, uh, and the de denominator is continually increasing because of this movement from the farms uh, and villages to the cities and the factories. Well, the numerator is constant. And so the contribution of the, of the movement of, uh, of the labor force to the total growth rate will decline. Now we can modify that in several ways. We could sort of say a higher number of people move if, if you want to keep the fraction constant. But in the end, the growth that is successful essentially must lead to a decline in the average rate of annual growth. And this happens across countries, and this is indisputable, it's simply inherent in the arithmetic. Now at some stage, at some stage, and I won't um, attempt to predict the date, uh, the excess labor on the farms will be exhausted. And one interpretation of the rapid growth of industrial wages the wages in the industry, in the factories, is that there, is, there are many fewer excess labor on the farms uh, than had generally uh, been assumed. In fact, my guess is that if one went to the, the farms, we would see that the labor force is really quite old. Uh, the young people have moved continually uh, for 30 years, uh, and their parents and their grandparents are left uh, in the countryside. Uh, so one reason uh, that we should expect that the growth rate in Japan, uh, sorry, in China will decline, is simply this reweighting. But uh, there are two other reasons uh, why the Chinese growth rate will, uh, will decline. The first is, the first of these two other reasons, is that the Growth was premised on the ability to grow China's exports. And China could capture market share of, of the world market as long as it was a relatively small exporter. But now China is either the world's largest exporter or the world's second largest exporter. And in many product lines, it's already the dominant world exporter. And so it becomes progressively more difficult to continue to capture world market share. Uh, one way to think about it is that China's going to continue to grow at 10% a year, and world export market is growing at 4% a year, and there's more or less a constant ratio between Chinese exports and Chinese GDP, then Chinese exports will be growing at two and a half times the world rate of growth of world's GDP, and that can happen when China's a small country, but it can happen when China's a large country. The second reason, the second reason why China is going to hit the wall in terms of export growth, it is, is that it is no longer a young country. Uh, it is aging. This is, of course, the aging of the population, but it's the aging of plant and equipment, uh, and the like. The younger countries of Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia, these countries have much lower wages uh, than, than uh, China. And they are going to capture uh, world market share from China. Uh, and that will mean that the China's exports will either decline or the prices of China's exports will continue to fall because China will find that it experiences the same pressures in the world market for exports that Korea did when Chinese, when, uh, Chinese exports uh, began to increase. Earlier I mentioned uh, 
a meeting that I was at in the early 1960s uh, with uh, Morita uh, in Tokyo. I remember the meeting well. I was a young researcher with a think tank in Washington, a group of business leaders from Washington, uh, and a, a counterpart group from Tokyo. Morita was there. I, I, I was sitting next to him at dinner, and I said, what is your dream? And he said, to have a TV set that will fit into my pocket. I thought, that's absolutely marvelous. Uh, his dream was fulfilled. But where is Sony today? Sony has been buried by Samsung. Uh, Samsung is a brilliant firm. Um, I will bet that many of the engineers in Samsung were Koreans, Japanese Koreans who worked for, for Sony uh, and then, then moved. Uh, and so the Japanese experience is great for Sony. Uh, uh, essentially has become a second tier firm. It is aged uh, and has been dominated uh, or it's lost market share to the younger uh, Samsung. Uh, firm. So that's the end of my Andy Warhol story and it's the end of the first part of its application uh, to the growth experience uh, in China uh, and I now want to um, come on to what I would call the, uh, the monetary disequilibrium that is present in China. One of the things that hit me at the conference uh, in the last two days was that the yeah, virtually every one of the 10 Chinese academics who was there talked about catching up with the United States as if that is the dominant Chinese uh, objective, catching up, catching up. Uh, and that phrase, I believe, that target has led to a series of economic policies that will mean that, unless they are changed, that China will re find that it will re repeat the Japanese growth experience, it will grow rapidly, and then there will be a dramatic change and the growth rate uh, will slow very, very sharply. I was asked in a question today, if you don't accept the objective of catching up with uh, the United States, what should the objective of economic policy be? And that's answer is um, very straightforward. The answer the choice for Chinese economic policy should be to increase the economic well-being of the current generation of young Chinese people in this room, of their children and of their grandchildren. What we, uh, one of the, I got here the other day uh, and I was impressed, actually I was depressed, by the smog. Uh, and I uh, sent a note to uh, a friend sitting next to me in the, conference today, an American friend, and said, what proportion of China's GDP would have to be spent to uh, eliminate smog or make it at least tolerable over the next five years? His answer was 3%. It was the back of the envelope calculation. That happened to be the same answer that I had come up with as the back of the envelope cal calculation. Don't ask to see either of our envelopes. It doesn't really matter whether the number is three to four or five percent. But why do I bring this up? China's trade surplus, its current account surplus, has been in the order of three to four to five percent of its GDP for the last 10 years. China now holds, as the owner of 3,000 billion of international reserve assets, mostly U.S. dollar securities. Every Chinese in this room owns 
about $2,500 of U.S. Treasury bills in drag. Uh, you should feel much wealthier than you do. Uh, go out and spend the money, but you can't, because that money, I think, has been almost irrevocably lost. There is no scenario in which China is likely to be able to uh, repatriate uh, that money uh, to, the, to the home country. But that represents a failure of government policy. Somebody had the opportunity to make the choice with an exchange rate policy and a tariff policy of whether China should have a large trade surplus or a trade balance of zero. If I had been the economic czar, I would have said a trade balance of zero, and I would have spent the three or four percent of GDP that has now been wasted away in buying U.S. Treasury bills in order to combat the smog. So, what are the uh, what are the symptoms? The symptoms of what I would call the failures of government policy. One is that the ratio of house prices to personal income in China is higher uh, than in virtually any other country. And this is true for the, either the top 10 cities, the top 15 cities, far less true if you go to the 50th city. But if you look at the cities which account for half the urbanization, you have a level of house prices which is uh, much higher than that experience in almost any other country except for Japan and other countries during their uh, economic bubble periods. Uh, ratio of house prices to income is much, much higher than the United States experience between 2002 and 2008. A second symptom of what I would call the monetary disequilibrium is that there are probably seven or eight or nine million houses that have been put up in the last six or seven years that are essentially unoccupied. People acquired these houses as investments. This is a waste of uh, productive uh, resources. A third symptom of what I would call economic waste is that the combined savings rate of the state-owned enterprises and households uh, and the government amount to 45 to 50 percent of GDP. That's much higher than virtually any other country except of Singapore. Another symptom of what I've called the monetary disequilibrium, one I mentioned earlier, was this very large trade surplus. China is the only a uh, rapidly growing developing country, and I hope I can use that phrase, which has had a trade surplus. Every other rapidly growing developing country has had a trade deficit. Uh, I could go through other, other symptoms, uh, but let me uh, then uh, speak to what is the cause? What is the cause of the monetary disequilibrium? Uh, when I, I think the last time I was in this room was probably in the of 2011, and at that time, uh, Ezra Bogle's uh, massive biography of Deng Xiaoping had just been published in English. I think it has just been published in Chinese. Ezra Bogle is the Harvard sociologist who in 1978 wrote the book with the great title that was a bestseller, Japan is Number One. He got a brief bit of fame, but he got it wrong. Japan was hoping to become number one, uh, but now Japan is, uh, is slipping. I bring this up because uh, Ezra mentions a trip that Deng Xiaoping made to Tokyo, and I have now forgotten the year, whether it was 1978 or 1982, but I think it was early in the 1980s. And when Deng Xiaoping was 
greatly impressed with the quality of life, the quality of the infrastructure that he observed when he was in Tokyo and Japan. And he essentially said, we're going to buy the Japanese model. And the Japanese model consists of having very low interest rates on households that household savers earn. Very low interest rate that business borrowers pay. Uh, and an excess demand for credit at the very low interest rates that the banks, essentially the state-owned uh, banks, are able to charge their borrowers. This is one policy is going to doom the Chinese economy unless it is changed. Uh, what this policy does is it encourages a very high level of household saving because the real value of household savings, the purchasing power of household savings, uh, continuously decline because the rate of increase in the price level, especially in the cities, is higher than the interest rates. A few years ago, I performed an experiment with a friend at Stanford. We compared how well Americans will live in retirement with how well a Japanese will live in retirement. The Japanese savings rate was three times the US savings rate. And from that datum alone, you would conclude the Japanese save more, therefore when it comes time to retire, they will have a much higher standard of living. But that conclusion was based on incomplete uh, data. If we can look at the rate of return that Americans would earn, it would be a positive three to 4% a year. If we looked at the rate of return the Japanese savers would work, earn, it would be three, it would be negative. So the Japanese had to have a high savings rate in order to essentially stay even. Um, and my memory of that experiment was that the Americans post-retirement would have 70% of their pre-retirement income. The Japanese would have 30%. But that low negative interest rate that the, Jap that, uh, the Chinese earn explains why you've had massive investment in housing. This is the only, one of the few feasible ways to accumulate personal wealth, and why seven or eight million housing units are, are unoccupied. Now the uh, <clears throat> second feature uh, of this Japanese style interest rate management policy is that it leads, as I said, to an excess demand for credit. That means that the state-owned banks have to engage in credit rationing. The demand for credit at these low interest rates exceeds the supply, and somebody has to decide which firms and which borrowers will, will get the credit. The only thing that is scarce in China Actually, I'm going to modify this. The only thing that is scarce besides space on the highways yeah. is, uh, is credit. Uh, this past summer, the US press gave a great deal of attention uh, to the life and tribulations of the former mayor of Chongqing. You remember that his son went to uh, to Oxford and then was at the Kennedy School. The son's monthly rent in Cambridge, Mass for an apartment was greater than the father's monthly salary as the mayor of Chongqing. But the press reported, and I'm simply repeating that the press reported, was that the Bo family uh, had $100 million in the bank. That's an awful lot of money. Uh, and how did they get that money? Well, my bet is that the Bo family was very instrumental in helping business firms in Chongqing and elsewhere where he had been a very important politician, uh, help the family essentially secure credit, uh, uh, 
credit which was then on lead, uh, or they got, is the term guanxi, uh, they got a cut uh, of the funds. Now what you have happening in, um, in China now is that the competition for credit comes from two different groups of fund, uh, firms. You have the state-owned enterprises, essentially a carryover from the command economy pre-1980 period. Uh, and you have the small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. Who is going to get credit in a, a preferred way? And the answer we know is it's going to be the state-owned enterprises. So the railroads are continually building high-speed railroads that have, will have a negative real rate of return of 30 or 40 percent a year, I mean, a little more productive than pyramids, yes. but not more productive than pyramids. While the private sector is, is essentially star for funds. Now, let me point toward my uh, conclusion. I mentioned that one of the uh, Sorry, I forgot to mention that one of, one of the brilliant decisions of Deng Xiaoping uh, was to invite in the, the multinationals. And one reason China's exports grew very, very rapidly uh, was that these great firms had supply chain, readily available supply chains, and they were able to essentially source of the markets that they had in the industrial countries with goods produced in China. But I also mention that China has become a high cost uh, producer compared with Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh, etc. And the logic is straightforward. The logic is straightforward. These multinationals are going to reduce the volume of their purchases in China, and they're going to increase the volume of their purchases in these other countries. And China will be left with a um, smaller number of export-oriented firms. One of my um, favorite questions for students is, name great world-class Japanese firms. Easy to do, you can come up with 20 firms easily. Name world-class South Korean firms. I've mentioned Sony, you can mention Lucky. Uh, you have the great automobile firms, either two or one and a half, depending how you're counting, uh, et cetera. And you can probably come up with 10 large South Korean firms for a country with a population of 40 million people. Name some great Chinese firms. If you get past three, you get a free lunch. Uh, the, uh, and now let me tie this together and conclude. Earlier, at the very beginning, I mentioned that we had this massive migration from the countryside to the city. These people need housing and they need uh, support services and infrastructure. In providing these facilities to these individuals probably has taken up, and now I'm making a guess, eight to eight to ten percent of China's savings. It's the the expansion uh, of the infrastructure investment, and I've also suggested that. Uh, the, the migration from the countryside to the cities is going to end. It just inherent in terms of the aging of the country and the depletion of the excess labor on the farms. When that happens, expenditure in the cities for infrastructure for the migrants will decline. And so the country will be left with a much lower level of expenditure, and it will still have a very high level of savings, and it will be in a position very much like Japan. And that position is, uh, the level of savings is extremely high relative to the level of investment, 
and therefore there is insufficient spending in, in the country. And that will lead to a very sharp decline uh, in the rate of growth of, of GDP. China, like Japan, will be a country with lots of potential, great excess supply, uh, but uh, insufficient, insufficient demand to absorb all, all the supply. And as that realization occurs, as the end of the migration from the cities, sorry, from the countryside to the cities uh, begins to appear, the overhang of the seven or 10 million unoccupied homes uh, in the cities uh, will, will begin, which has taken up a lot of uh, the savings. That overhang uh, will lead to distressed sales of people who essentially want to realize their capital gains. And there will be a rush to sell. Uh, and the next financial crisis will be just down the street.